The Boy Who Painted Christ Black by John Herrick Clark He was the smartest boy in his county school for colored children. Everybody knew this. The teacher always pronounced his name clearly as she pointed him out as the ideal student. Once I heard her say, if he were white, he might someday become president. Only Aaron Crawford wasn't white, quite the contrary. His skin was so solid black that it glowed, reflecting a goodness that was strange and beyond my comprehension. His great variety of talent often startled the teachers. This caused his classmates to look upon him with a mixed feeling of awe and envy. Before Thanksgiving, he always drew turkeys and pumpkins on the blackboard. On George Washington's birthday, he drew large American flags surrounded by little hatchets. It was these small masterpieces that made him the most talked about colored boy in Columbus, Georgia. The Negro principal of the county school said he would someday be a great painter. For the teacher's birthday, about a week before commencement, Aaron Crawford painted the picture that caused an uproar and a turning point at the Muscogee County School. The moment he entered the room that morning, all eyes fell on him. He was carrying a large square parcel wrapped in old newspapers. As he went to his seat, the teacher's eyes followed his every motion. Aaron put his books down. Then, smiling broadly, advanced toward the teacher's desk. His alert eyes were so bright with joy that they were almost frightening. The children were learning forward in their seats, I'm sorry, leaning forward in their seats, staring greedily at him, waiting eagerly to see what he was carrying. Already the teacher sensed that Aaron had a present for her. Still smiling, he placed it on the desk and began to help her unwrap it. As the last piece of paper fell from the large frame, the teacher jerked her hand away from it suddenly, her eyes flickering unbelievingly. Her heavy breathing was frightening. There was no other sound in the room. Aaron stared questioningly at her, and she moved her head back to the present cautiously. As if it were a dangerous living thing, I'm sure it was the one thing she least expected. With a quick movement, I rose up from my desk. Murmurs spread through the room. The teacher turned toward the children, trying to quieten them down with her eyes. They did not move their eyes from the present that Aaron had brought her. It was a large picture of Christ, painted black. Aaron Crawford went back to his seat, a feeling of triumph reflected in his every movement. The teacher faced us. Her half-smile had become uncertain. She searched the bright faces before her and started to smile again, occasionally stealing quick glances at the large picture propped on her desk. Aaron, she spoke at last, this is a most welcome present. Thanks. I will treasure it. She paused and went on speaking. Looks like you're going to be quite an artist. Suppose you come forward and tell the class how you came to paint this remarkable picture. When he rose to speak to explain about the picture, there was silence and the children gave him all of their attention. Something they rarely did for the teacher. He did not speak at first. He just stood there in front of the room observing his audience carefully, like a great concert artist. It was like this, he said, placing full emphasis on every word. You see, my uncle, who lives in New York, teaches classes in Negro history. When he visited us last year, he was telling me about the many great black folks who have made history. He said black folks were once the most powerful people on earth. 
When I asked him about Christ, he said no one ever proved whether he was black or white. Somehow a feeling came over me that he was a black man because he was so kind and forgiving, kinder than I have ever seen white people be. So when I painted this picture, I couldn't help but paint it as I thought it was. After this, the little artist sat down, smiling broadly as if he had discovered something that ordinary people could never know. The teacher could do nothing but invite the children to come forward so they could get a good view of Aaron's unique piece of art. When I came close to the picture, I noticed it was painted with the kind of paint you get in the five and ten cent stores. Its shape was blurred slightly, as if someone had knocked the frame before the paint had time to dry. The eyes of Christ were deep set and sad, very much like those of Aaron's father, who was a minister in the local Baptist church. This picture of Christ looked much different from the one I saw hanging on the wall when I was in Sunday school. It looked more like a helpless Negro, pleading silently for mercy. For the next few days, there was much talk about Aaron's picture. The school term ended the following week, and Aaron's picture, along with the best work done by the students that year, was on display in the assembly room. Naturally, Aaron's picture was in a place of honor. There was no ordinary school to be done on commencement day, and all the children were full of joy. The girls in their brightly colored dresses gave the school the delightful air of the beginning of spring. In the middle of the day, all the children were gathered in the assembly hall. On this day, we always had a visit from a man from whom all the teachers spoke of with mixed steam and fear, Professor Daniel, they called him. He was supervisor of all the city schools, including those ones set aside for colored children. When the great man arrived, the children rose, bowed politely, and sat down again, their eyes examining him closely. He was a tall white man with solid gray hair. His eyes were the clearest blue I have ever seen. They were the only lifelike things about him. As he made his way to the front of the room, the Negro principal, George Duval, was walking ahead of him, cautiously preventing anything from getting in his way. As he passed me, I heard the teachers frightened, sucking in their breath felt the tension tightening. A large, carefully polished chair was in the center of the platform. The supervisor went straight to it. The Negro principal introduced the distinguished guest, and he gave us a short speech. It wasn't a very important speech. After he had sat down, the school chorus sang two spirituals, and the girls in the fourth grade did an Indian folk dance. This brought the commencement program to an end. After this, the supervisor came down the platform and began to view the work on display in front of the chapel. Suddenly, his face changed. His clear blue eyes flickered in astonishment. He was looking at Aaron Crawford's picture of Christ. Mechanically, he moved closer to the picture and stood in gazing fixedly as though it were a dangerous animal that would rise any moment and destroy everything. We waited tensely for this, move, this next movement. The silence was almost suffocating. At last, he twisted himself around and began to search the grim faces before him. His eyes came to rest on the Negro principal. Who painted this sacrilegious nonsense? He demanded sharply. I painted it, sir. These were Aaron's words, spoken hesitantly. He wetted his lips timidly and looked up at the supervisor, his eyes voicing a sad plea for understanding. He spoke again, this time more coherently. The principal said a colored person 
have just as much right painting Jesus black as a white person have painting him white. And he says, at this point, he halted abruptly, as if to search for his next words. He stammered out a few words, then stopped again. The supervisor took a few steps towards him. His face was red with rage. Well, go on, he said angrily. I'm still listening. Aaron moved his lips, but no words passed them. His eyes wandered around the room, testing finally with an air of hope on the face of the Negro principal. After a moment, he turned his face away again, as if something he had said had betrayed an understanding between him and the principal. Then the principal stepped forward to defend the school's prize student. I encouraged the boy in painting that picture, he said firmly, and it was with my permission that he brought the picture into the school. I don't think the boy is so far wrong in painting Christ black. The artists of all other races have painted whatsoever God they worship to resemble themselves. I see no reason why we cannot do the same. After all, Christ was born in that part of the world that had always been populated by colored people. There is a strong possibility that he could have been a Negro. But for the sound of heavy breathing, I would have sworn that his words had frozen everyone in the room. I had never heard the principal speak so boldly to anyone, black or white. The supervisor swallowed. His face was full of silent rage. Have you been teaching these children things like that? He asked the Negro principal sternly. I have been teaching them that their race has produced great, great kings and queens as well as slaves and servants, the principal said. The time is long overdue when we should let the world know that we created and enjoy the splendid civilization long before the people of Europe had a written language. The supervisor coughed. You're not getting paid to teach such things in a school, and I shall have to ask you to resign as principal. George Duvall did not speak. He turned round slowly and walked out of the room towards his office. The supervisor's eyes followed him until he was out of focus. Then he murmured, There will be a lot of fuss in this world if you start people thinking that Christ was a N-word. Some of the teachers followed the principal out of the chapel, leaving the children restless and not knowing what to do next. Finally, we started back to our rooms. The supervisor was behind me. I heard him murmur to himself, Damn if n isn't getting smarter. n isn't getting smarter. A few days later, I heard that the principal had accepted a summer job as an instructor, as an art instructor of a small high school somewhere in South Georgia, and had gotten permission from Aaron's parents to take him along so he could continue to encourage him in his painting. I was on my way home when I saw him leaving his office. He was carrying a large briefcase and some books tucked under his arm. He had already said goodbye to all the teachers, and strangely, he did not look broken-hearted. As he headed for the large front door, he readjusted his glasses, but did not look back. He had the appearance of a man who had done a great thing something greater than an any ordinary man would do. Aaron Crawford was waiting outside for him. They walked down the street together. He put his arms around Aaron's shoulder affectionately. He was talking sincerely to Aaron about something, but Aaron was listening, deeply earnest. I watched them until they were far down the street. Even from this distance, I could see they were still walking like two people who had won some sort of victory. <laughs>